our guest tonight. Uh, we're pleased to have Gwen Farrell uh, from MUFON. And uh, MUFON is the world's largest grassroots UFO uh, organization that looks into that strange phenomena. So Gwen, we want to welcome you. And uh, why don't you give us a little bit about your, um, your qualifications? You are, you've been a field investigator mm -hmm. for MUFON. Talk, talk a little bit about that. What different roles have you had with MUFON? Um, well, I joined MUFON, uh, Phoenix MUFON to be specific, in 2006. I had been looking for them for a while and they had, were, had been sort of defunct uh, for a while and they finally started up again and I was lucky enough to find them. I was very interested, having had a lifelong interest in the topic and immediately uh, applied to be a field investigator and got started doing that. Um, I enjoyed doing that very much. Um, so that's what I, how I began with MUFON. Um, then several years later, uh, only about three years ago, I guess, um, I began working on MUFON's experiencer research team, which Dan is also um, a member of and involved with. And so that's another aspect of MUFON that I have worked, that I am working on now. Um, I'm also an author and have written several articles that have been in the MUFON journal over the years. Um, and I sort of coordinate um, the, what's called the ERT files, which is a bi-monthly column that appears in the MUFON journal of articles that are written by members of the ERT or the Experience of Research team. So um, I think that's pretty much my MUFON. Um, I've been, of course, to a few of the MUFON conferences and things, but that's, uh, I'm not an acting field investigator anymore. When I decided to specifically start doing experiencer therapy, then I left that um, sort of nuts and bolts area of, Phoenix, of MUFON and then moved into uh, the other area, which was a little bit newer at that time. So, but I still uh, consult with some um, field investigators and work with a few, of course, through the ERT, which you're familiar with. So let, for, I'm sure most of our listeners will be familiar <coughs> with MUFON, but can we talk just a little bit about that organization quickly as a kind of a summary? It's the Mutual UFO Network. That's right. And it's, it's main, it, it's mission and it's, it's been around for quite a while and has many different chapters. And can you t tell, about its, uh, tell us about its mission and sort of its day-to-day -day activities? Um, I can't give you the exact words about the mission statement, um, yeah, but it has been around since the end of Project Blue Book, which was, I think, in 1967. Dan, you're, you may know more about that. You're I think it was 1969. Historian. 69, right. Yeah. Um, and so actually MUFON and a few other um, groups were already going at that time, but MUFON kind of stepped out um, kind of in the lead at that point and the, the organization began to grow. So it does stand for the Mutual UFO Network. Many people uh, know about it. They've seen it on TV. They've seen it in movies. They've seen it in the X-Files. They've mm -hmm. seen it in all kinds of things. And so they're familiar with it that way, but it really is a legitimate organization. I can't tell you how many people are members of it. It is an international organization in many different countries, many different chapters, and it's possible to be a member of MUFON without being a field investigator or being involved in any of their official investigative work. And so that's what the majority of people who are involved in MUFON are. They're MUFON members. They support the organization because they believe in it. Um, they read the MUFON journal every month, and they contribute by going to the MUFON symposiums annually, everything. So um, it is, as Dan mentioned earlier, the largest, um, I guess, privately run um, 
organization for the exploration of UFOs in the world. And it began just as just that, investigating sightings, investigating UFOs, on what we call a kind of a nuts and bolts, uh, from a nuts and bolts angle. Mm -hmm. But in the past 10 years or so, um, MUFON has grown, of course, as we've had new members come in and as we've learned more about what's going on in this field and has created the ERT, which is the Experiencer Research Team. I serve on, Dan is on that as well, and we work specifically with experiencers. So if you think you've seen something, if you've had a sighting, you can go on to the MUFON website and there's a button that you can click if you would like to have your sighting investigated by a trained field investigator. If you would just wanna to talk to someone and you don't really have anything you want investigated, but you think you may be an experiencer, then you can go onto the website, you click another button, and it will give you an opportunity to reach out to the experiencer research team, which is who we are. Um, everyone on the team is trained and experienced in working with contactees, abductees, and experiencers. Um, most of them are not um, psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, or even therapists. Most of them are field investigators. They are people who are very knowledgeable in the field, and they're very caring and compassionate people. And we are very um, blessed to be able to reach out and to help people in that way. A, a good summary, definitely. And it's, there's a chapter almost within, you know, not too far, too many miles from most major cities for cities. sure. But, mm -hmm. uh, so you can reach out and find one. I was a member of one back in the mid 90s. I think I moved to Seattle. There was something up in Bothell or uh, I think yeah. Bothell, north of Seattle. I know, Dan, you're currently or you were working as a field investigator. Is that right? But you're yeah, not. I, yeah, I don't I don't do that anymore now. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get into that if you want. But I just I found the ERT uh, aspect of it a lot more interesting. And to quote uh, uh, Maureen Morgan, who's the state director of Washington, uh, I think the key to the UFO mystery lies with the ERT uh, part of it. It's not the weird lights in the sky kind of thing. Anyway, that's why I was drawn to that. Well, well, let me just interject here because I I think we all have a certain um, way that we would like the interview to go. I mean, to, to, to the interesting stuff, to the three of us. <clears throat> but I want to pose to Gwen the, the question of how big is the chasm um, between what you read about so-called ET in the, the, the major media and the reality of what's happening. And I, I, you know, this question comes to me because just a couple of days ago was uh, a big article about um, a scientist. I can't remember where he, what university, where he's from, but he said in 2017, we were contacted by ET. And he was referring to the Oumuamua um, object, the, yeah. mm -hmm. the asteroid that came from an, um, uh, an, a, such an angle that it was clearly extra solar. It was outside the solar system. It wasn't something that's been uh, spinning around the sun forever. It came into our solar system from somewhere else on such a shallow angle that it was undeniable that it was from somewhere else. And so mm -hmm. uh, they called it an interstellar visitor, meaning between the stars. And this um, scientist's announcement, of course, was met with the typical ridicule uh, of his colleagues and everyone else, although the articles are becoming a little more um, accepting of some of these ideas. But in general, it's, that's as far as we get. Is there's a big space rock that may have come. It may be ET. It may have been the remnants of a civilization, blah, blah, blah. But it's always something very, very far away from us as opposed to what you deal with on a regular basis, which is people who have had direct contact with these, again, in quotes, ETs, interstellar mm -hmm. beings, 
uh, interdimensional, whatever. So there's a giant chasm between what we're allowed to believe and what is actually happening. I truly believe, I know Dan and you are on the same page as far as that goes, but what is your feeling about that very big distance between, um, you know, those two sides? And that's where I want to go sort of in this conversation, but we can take detours along the way, of course, but I just want to put that out there, you know, before I, before we get going. Get going. Okay. Um, well, you're right. There's definitely a huge chasm between um, what people are experiencing personally and what you hear in the media. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that's why we have, I think, MUFON and other groups like that, because we recognize that this stuff is real. Whatever it is, people are having experiences that cannot be explained. And we try to investigate. And I, as a therapist, just try to work with people who need my help in this area. Um, but we, by necessity, have sort of um, created this like uh, bubble of ufologists. We've created this area that we call ufology. And it's huge. There are millions of people who are involved in it, not just as, as experiencers, but people who are investigators, researchers, people who are just interested in hearing about it and reading about it wherever they can find it, buying books, etc. That is kind of its own little world. And even within that, we have controversy because we are human beings. And as human beings, we're, we're never going to agree on everything. Um, then, so we have sort of created this bubble that is ufology in order to be able to do something, to share with other like-minded people and to try to investigate and try to work together. Then outside that, you have the whole rest of the world. And um, those people, the other people who are not in ufology, many of them, I believe, many millions of them, are also experiencers and believers. They're out there too, but for whatever reason they have, opportunity, um, their, how they feel about their experiences, they never look at them. So yeah, there is a big chasm. Um, I always encourage people, and I, and I talk about it in my book too, to be open-minded and just be aware that what you're seeing in the media is very different from what we know as reality, from what people are seeing every day or every night in their lives. Um, I know exactly what you mean. I have been in the closet for many years for what I do as a ufologist, a closet ufologist and therapist. Um, I, was a, I, I began as a, a certified hypnotherapist doing just normal general hypnotherapy for people who want to stop smoking, lose weight, working with people with trauma, PTSD, all the other things. And that was an open, you know, respectable thing. Um, then when I sort of took a turn and became interested in ufology and got deeply involved in it through MUFON, um, then um, things changed a bit. So it kind of had to slip into that other closet. Um, so there are many people that I know who honestly don't know what I do. And uh, they, they know what I do in part of my life, which is fine with me, but they don't understand the depth of how I'm involved in this field. And um, if they're ever interested, I'm happy to share that with them. But there are so many things that people are dealing with in the world now that I prefer to, you know, just kind of let people come to me, but it's kind of a long answer. I'm not sure that that answers your question. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely. I, I just see a big, big, uh, I see, I don't know if you'll agree, but I do see a trend toward more acceptance. I mean, it's just painfully slow. I guess that's how the process goes when you're trying to for one thing, maintain tight control over it, which I believe is the case with the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the intelligence, the government, the 18 intelligence agencies we have in this country alone, mm -hmm. trying to coordinate among them 
and between other countries' uh, intelligence apparatus, it's just, you know, it's, it must be a nightmare for them. Some, sometimes I feel for those who are participating in the cover-up because even if you wanted to, to speed the process up, it would just be almost impossible because you have so many moving parts, so many different interests. Uh, but, but really, you know, the question is, do you see a movement towards greater acceptance? Will it ever come on an official uh, level or is it going to come from a, a, you know, a grassroots level like you're seeing, just a critical mass of experiencers who finally just say, hey, look, this is what's going on. There are more of us than there are of you, skeptics or non-believers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just becomes a reality. I mean, is that more likely how it will happen? What are, what are your feelings on that? Um, I think that's correct. Um, certainly over the 12, 13 years that I've been involved in this work, um, I have seen more acceptance. Um, the popular media is really leading us in that direction. Even though sometimes they are, I believe, from what I've heard from experiencers, the popular media is way off when they're talking about what ETs look like and how they behave. Um, but the media and, and entertainment industry is really leading us to disclosure. They're helping us to understand it better. They're helping us to feel more comfortable with it. I tend to be a little bit on the pessimistic side. I don't believe that I will ever live to see 100% disclosure. But I believe our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will because they're the ones that are going to bring it about. I, I think I have a little thing that I talk about in my book that um, one of these days the ETs are going to land on the White House lawn <laughs> and our great-grandchildren are going to say, what took you so long? <laughs> no, they're not going to be afraid. They're not going to have a problem. They're not going to say, get out the guns um, because it's, I believe it's going to come to that. Um, some people talk about ascension and how we're going to change spiritually and all of this, and we're going to reach an ET's level. I don't know about that. But I do believe after studying human beings and hoping to have some understanding of us, that it's going to happen eventually. Now, disclosure, I think, has to come from two sides, though. It has to not only come from us, from our governments or our power bases, but it has to come from the otherworldly beings as well. And if they're just coming to us one person at a time, like they have been forever, or small groups, then I think they have a reason for wanting to do that. That's a good reason, even though I don't know, I can't answer for them. So disclosure is going to have to come from two sides. I don't think I'll live to see it, but I think humanity will. And, and we're getting there, but it's tiny little, little moves, I think. And it is very frustrating from our perspective, I think, that it's so slow because I know Dan, I'll, I'll let Dan talk a little bit of, eventually, Dan. I know you've got That's many. That's okay, no. <laughs> You're doing fine, Dan. I'm speaking for you, I believe, also, because we've had so many conversations about this, is that it just seems so painfully slow. I mean, mm -hmm. I would take disclosure tomorrow. If I was given the option, I think, regardless of the many, many different consequences, my life would change drastically. Everyone's lives would change, but I think it has to happen and to, um, you know, have to accept what Gwen just proposed, and I agree with her, is that it won't be for another generation or two mm -hmm. before it happens. It's very hard to take, um, you know, for me personally, I don't know, how do you feel about that, Dan? Or are you just going to let, you know, you're happy to let it unfold because <laughs> he's a very easygoing guy, but talk about that for a minute. Well, um, um, we were talking, I don't know, maybe, I think Gwen knows Alita to be, do you know Alita, Gwen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she's a buddy of ours and uh, she participates in a contact that I think I told you on, online that we were trying to do some CE five yeah, contacts right. mm -hmm. well I'll lead us part of that anyway oh. so we were having a discussion about the disclosure I said you know i don't think we really need disclosure if disclosure means the government's going to come out and tell you what's going on that's just not going to happen the government 
scared of that. I suggested go to Lita's group, go to Gwen Farrell's group. Disclosures going on right there. Mm-hmm. It's it's not in the big headlines, but uh, I think that's that. When I think of disclosure, I think of that more incremental approach, mm-hmm. which I think you're talking about. I want to ask a question about the word experiencer. So when I first uh, started reading about UFOs and people having UFO contacts, there were two groups of people, the contactees. And I remember reading about uh, guys like George Adamski, if you remember Mm -hmm, him, he kind of Mm -hmm. set up a UFO religion. And then the the guy from uh, Switzerland, Billy Meyer, the Mm one-armed guy. So then all of a sudden it moved from talking about those kind of benign interactions to people like Betty and Barney Hill. And we're going to have Kathleen Martin on our program here in the near future. And uh, Mm -hmm. Travis uh, Walton, who's from your neck of the woods Mm -hmm. and Calvin Parker, who's been on this program. So it went from kind of a benign, Hey, let's all meet the aliens to people getting uh, taken against their will. So my question is, so why do we call them experiencers? Why don't we use that term abductee or contactee anymore? And then does that mean ex- can somebody who's experiencing any strange phenomena, should we consider them, and I'm talking about ghosts here too, mm-hmm. would we consider them being experiencers? Um, okay. The terms um, that you're talking about, um, abductees, contactees and experiencers. Um, Those have changed over time. You're exactly right. Early on, there were experiences, what we would call contact experiences that were benevolent. People were interested in them. We had the Space Brothers movement and these uh, groups like this. Then things took a turn with Betty and Barney Hill. And because of their experiences, they didn't do it. It wasn't their fault. But because of their experience and because it was the right time in the world for people to be interested in that, and they were able to publicize their story, um, you know, uh, media, some of the media outlets took it and put it out there for people to see, um, things changed because they had an abduction type experience. So then you had Whitley Strieber who wrote his famous book, and he probably did more than anybody else has done to to get people thinking about abductions, that is being taken against their will. And again, he didn't do it to cause any issues or anything. It's just he he put his experiences out there. Now, I think that there have always been what we might call abductees, always been what we might call experiencers and contactees. It's just different. This is a huge, huge phenomenon that we're involved in here. And I believe that even though there are commonalities among the different experiences that people have, every one of them is different because every person is an individual. They perceive things differently. They process things differently through their mind and their spirit. And they're all a little different. So Technically, then, if you want to talk about terms, the term experiencer came about because um, many people who were who had positive experiences or neutral experiences with otherworldly beings or ETs, they didn't like being called abductees because they wanted to identify themselves as what they experienced. They didn't want to talk about being taken against their will. They didn't want to talk about bad ETs because they had good experiences. And so we had this sort of a movement within ufology where people purposely started using the term experiencer instead of abductee. And contactee has kind of uh, come along with that as well. So there are, uh, we don't use abductee a lot at all. I hardly ever use it. Um, I tend to just use the word experiencer or contactee because it covers everything. So, so um, there, and there are many different kinds of experiences. Uh, you, you mentioned that. Um, basically, if you look at the, uh, the definition of the word experiencer through psychology, it's just anybody who experiences anything. 
Uh-huh. It's an experiencer. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing. We're all experiencers, okay? We have to uh, hone that down to what we're talking about here. So someone who has a paranormal experience, yeah, they're an experiencer. But we don't typically use that term to refer to people in the paranormal field, although that's a whole other story because the fields are coming closer and closer all the time. We're finding that. Um, So, yeah, um, an experiencer can be someone who sees a light in the sky. They see it. They process it. They experience it. Well, they're an experiencer. Maybe they didn't have an ET come into their bedroom, but they're still experiencers. So is that kind of? Yeah. That, that's good. I was looking for the distinctions. So how would you, how would you know if you're an experiencer? And I'm talking about more from the ET side of things than the general paranormal uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. How would you know if you're an experiencer? There is, there are many things that you would, that you would happen to you that might mean that you're an experiencer. And there's a list I've got it in a couple of my books. Other people have published it too. It's kind of a list that experienced therapists and investigators have put together over the years. And it's quite lengthy. So I won't go into it all. I could read you a few of them. I've got my book right here. But basically there are things that people experience that many other people have also experienced. And so we say, well, okay, if you're an experiencer and this is what's happened to you, um, Like, for instance, you have missing time and you have three or four more other people or three or four hundred more people who've also had missing time. Then we can say missing time may be a symptom of being an experiencer. Does that make sense? So that is how we have put together this list. When nobody just dreamt these things up and said, Scientifically, let's make a list on what means you're an experiencer. We have taken the information from all the millions of experiencers that we've talked to through the years. So if you'd like me to pull a book out and read a few of the things, I can. Otherwise, I can just tell you that I'm not the only author who's written about it. If anybody wants to know, they can go online and just say, how do I know I'm an experiencer? And they can they can find that out. But what I always try to I emphasize with my clients and the people that I talk to is that, as I said before, this is a huge field and everybody's experience is a little different. So just because your experience isn't just like somebody else's, that doesn't mean it's not valid. You know, if you go to a conference and you hear people talking about someone gets up on the podium and talks about how they were contacted and they had all this information and you're thinking, well, Mine wasn't like that. So does that mean I'm not an experiencer? Does that mean that that's not valid what I experienced? No, no, no. You know, just know that they're all different and they're basically all valid. Well, I, I have a question relating <clears throat> to the, the topic you're, you're um, getting into right now, which is, of course, fascinating because it highlights, uh, again, the differences in human the human mind, I mean, we're all of the same species, right? But the way we take in information, the way we process it, the way we um, share it, so on, can be very different among individuals, of course. And I think you have a unique perspective on this, just with your background, working with Mm -hmm. people um, therapy-wise, but also with people who have these extraordinary experiences, which potentially can create uh, PTSD in a person, you know, what, what's more traumatic than, you know, having a mind meeting with an extraterrestrial or someone who appears to be not of this world in whatever, mm-hmm. whatever respect. But this question always comes up, at least in my mind, uh, for our guests who discuss the UFO, the ET subject, and that is how can um, individuals experience such different things in uh, these experiences with the with extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings um, such that we can't even agree on even the smallest of details. Mm-hmm. And my question always is, is that a uh, problem that we see? And I think that's what really holds us back a lot too in, in these investigations, as hard as we try and as, as scientific as we try to be in the protocols 
and MUFON. I know MUFON's done a, a heroic job of trying to standardize the the way that you interview people and the way that you record their answers and so on. But it's just been so hard. I think it was Jacques Vallée who, uh, I don't know if he was the one who coined the term the omniverse, meaning, or the omnijective, I think, between the subjective and the, mm. um, the objective. I think most of us assume wrongly that there's an objective reality. Um, I, you know, it's hard to make that case even that there's something we all agree upon. But there's something even in between that, possibly. And so where is that influence coming from? Is it all in the human mind, in your opinion, or is it coming from the other beings, or is it a, a more complicated mix of both? Are there screen memories that are interfering with our ability to be very specific even in multiple witness cases, the witnesses almost never agree on all the details. Some people see it, uh, you know, a being in a Nazi uniform or whatever, and other people see beings in angelic mm -hmm. um, robes. And it just varies so much. To me, that's one of the most frustrating parts about these anecdotes or these reports is that I can't seem to get a straight answer on even the most fundamental facts about the experience. So what, what do you attribute that problem to? Well, I'm not sure that there is a straight answer. Um, if you're looking for an answer that's going to apply to everyone, um, to all human beings, and you want to call it something like truth with a capital T, which is a whole, you know, other ball of wax um, that we could talk about. But um, it is... This problem that you mentioned with being able to nail these experiences down and look at them from the scientific method is largely the reason that they're not, well, that's the reason they're not accepted by science. Mm -hmm. And another reason why they're not accepted by just people on the street, everybody, you know, the general public, because they are so different and they are absolutely subjective. So you and I can look at the same picture and we can then describe them the picture completely differently um, because we process everything every experience in our lives through our own mind that involves experience it involves memories it involves emotions it involves beliefs the human mind is unbelievable mixture of all of these things, physical, mental, spiritual, everything. We're all very holistic beings. So um, you can't really say that there is a scientific way to look at this. So that does make it more difficult, um, you know, when you're trying to look at it. It is my belief after studying psychology and the work that I've done and the many hundreds of people that I've talked to that it is not just the experience of those other beings that makes the event. It is definitely what the individual is experiencing. So it is our belief system. It is our opinions. It is how we can deal with these things that help to shape the experience. So sometimes people say, how can it be that some people can have such horrible, terrifying, negative experiences and other people are just blissful, they're wonderful, they're so happy. People automatically assume, oh, well, it's the difference in the aliens. You know, some of the aliens are really good and the other aliens are really bad. Well, there probably are good aliens and bad aliens, but from my perspective, from all the work I've done over the years, there's a lot more that comes from the human side than we realize and that we may be willing to admit. So, um, yeah, it is the human mind that perceives things and bends things and shapes things and creates things and comes up with an experience. So do you, do you uh, believe that there's any projection or interference from the other side then, from these beings, what we're calling beings. We don't really know their true nature, of course, but do you think there's a potential that there are different motivations of multiple, you know, different groups and that it's confused intentionally for some 
reason? I mean, do you have reason to believe that? I don't know if I believe. I mean, I think I believe that personally, but mm -hmm. you know, from your experience with so many different people, how do you feel about that? Aspect? Yeah. Um, well, I believe, um, I don't really know either. With all the people that I've worked with, I'm kind of like you. I hmm. still haven't made up my mind because just about the time I sort of think I know what's going on, then you know, somebody else comes to me and, and talks to me about it. And so I kind of decided a while back that I'm just going to help people. I'm going to listen and try to learn and try not to try to really figure out what's going on. Um, but from what I hear from people, and I think the popular belief now in ufology is that there are that different races or different groups of extraterrestrials, otherworldly beings, interdimensional beings, whatever, are um, interfering with the human race or interacting with the human race for certain for certain reasons. They have motivations for, for being here. Um, I think that it probably is a big investment for any beings from any planet to get here. I mean, think about how much it cost us for our space program. And, and I believe that if there are other, um, maybe it's not the same with, if, with beings who are not humanoid. But I believe the humanoid beings probably have to work to create the programs that get them here. So they really want to be here and they have a reason for being here. I don't think that, that they just say, oh, hey, it's Saturday night. We're kind of bored. Let's fly <laughs> to Earth and see what these crazy humanoids are doing right now. Um, uh, some of them, I believe, may, may be here unwittingly maybe they didn't know where they were come where they were going to land or why they're here but they're here um some are definitely here because they have a plan some of those plans don't look very good at least they're, they're not beneficial to humans to us and to the earth perhaps but that's what people believe and i think that that's probably likely is that there are different races different groups that come here for different purposes. Some of them who used to come here don't come here any longer. Um, and we are seeing, we have seen the experience of contact change over the last 10, 15 years, what people are reporting. Contact has changed. There's fewer and fewer reports of negative experiences and more reports of positive experiences. So fewer abductions and more of the other types, which are like visits and takings and uh, what, we, what we call other types of contact experiences. So what is that about? I mean, who has changed? Have the ETs changed? Maybe the ones that, used that, that abducted Betty and Barney Hill, they were around here for a while, you know, they got after Whitley Strieber um, and did things like that, then they're gone. So maybe, or there aren't as many of them, or maybe they realize that that's not the best way to get what they want. And so they're getting nicer now. <laughs> or are they the same ETs and we are the ones who are growing Changed. and changing? Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wondered about the first time I talked to an experiencer, not on the program, but as part of the ERT, is, um, and I'll have to be honest, I thought, is this person crazy? And my background is not mental health. I, I was a bit of college instructor. I was a licensed social worker, but I, I dealt with criminals, so I didn't deal with mental health kind of issues. So as a therapist, what what do you do with that? If somebody tells you something that's just really far out, and some of these experiences ha may have really far out experiences, how do you know whether or not they're not there's a screw loose there. Well, I'll tell you, I have never heard an experience in my life that was not far out. I mean, they are all way out. I mean, when you just compare them to what we think of an everyday reality. And I have definitely heard pretty much the gamut of what's out there, although who knows, you know, there could be something new for me tomorrow. Um, but the first thing I have to do is listen. As a therapist, I have a different function than when I was a field investigator. Mm -hmm. When I was a field investigator, what I was interested in was, did it really happen? Mm -hmm. Did it really happen? Are they telling the truth? Is it a hoax? Are they making it up? And what was it? How can we label it as something that we can make sense of and accept? As a therapist, I don't do that. My job as a therapist is just to listen to and to help people get to the point that they want to get to. 
So somebody comes to me because they're having an issue and they need some help in getting there. Okay, what do you, what, how, where do you want to get? How do you want to take care of this? And then we, we can work through that. And it's the same way with experiencers. Some of them are terribly traumatic and you have to, and it's difficult sometimes to work with people who are going through that. I am not a psychiatrist, psychologist, or medical professional, even though I've, I've had lots of psychology classes. So if I ever have someone who I feel is in need of medical help or psychological help, then I always refer them to a professional. In my career, I've had less than 10 people that I've had to do that with because I know pretty much what everybody's going to tell me is going to sound like they're nuts. <laughs> so give people time, let them talk, let them share, and then see what they want to do about that. And most people are not nuts. Yeah. Um, they may think they are. Um, and so that's what we are here for is just to listen to them and let them know that we don't think they're nuts. Now, sometimes people are. And there are certain signs of mental illness. And if you're a therapist and you use something that you would need to do, Dan, if you don't know this already and you haven't done it, is know what those signs are. And uh, even though you're not a medical person and you can't diagnose or judge someone, it's important to understand what they really are. And then just realize that everything you hear is going to sound like a wacko. Uh -huh. no. uh -huh. So uh, what I do is I refer people if, if I need to. Yeah, I was wondering, so you don't like ever administer the MMPI or anything like that. You just, you have kind of a screening technique you use. Tom, we'll talk, talk maybe a little bit about, in brief, about that screening technique. What would you, how would you screen somebody for uh, some type of mental illness versus just a very, uh, an incident of high strangeness? Mm -hmm. um, well, I listen to them talk first. Um, usually I would, when I'm not in practice anymore, I've been retired from my practice for a couple of years. So I'm just writing, consulting and doing things like that now. But um, I always in my practice gave someone a free 45 minute session with me, which was a screening session, which was a chance to come in either on the phone or in person, chat with me, see if they like me, see if there's a, you know, something between us that we feel like we can move forward with. And if I can help them, and if I can't help them, I tell them, look, you know, you need somebody else or um, you're not crazy, but I have another therapist friend who I think you would get along better with, or, you know, to try to steer them in the right direction. And then I, I just listen to them. Listening to them is so important. And uh, having the experience that I have working in ufology for so many years, like I said, I've heard about just about everything. And, and people will trust you. If they trust you, they know that you know what you're talking about. They know that you um, understand what they're talking about. And so basically, I listen. It's pretty easy to tell if someone's having a psychological issues just because of, the, of their behaviors. And then, as I said, I wouldn't... Um, I would, I would try to refer them to someone else. So I, I don't really have what I can call a standard. Like I don't use the tests that you talked about um, to work with anyone. I've never done that. I talk to people. I see how they're doing. I do also, or I used to, also utilize hypnotherapy. Uh, different kinds of hypnotherapy, different kinds of talk therapy, group, excuse me, group therapies. Um, and uh, some regression, although regression was never, that's, has never been the, the main part of the hypnosis that I work with. Well, so that's kind of where I am with that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about hypnosis, the pros and cons of that as a tool to deal with people that have uh, these kind of events. So what would you say about uh, the pros and cons of hypnosis? What can it do? What can it not do? Um, I believe in my own experience and studies that hypnosis can be a very valuable tool. When it's used correctly in a therapeutic environment, um, but it's not for everyone. It doesn't work for everyone. There is no therapeutic tool on this earth that I've ever heard of that works for everyone. So that's why you have a therapist. That's why you go to a therapist who can take you through some of these things and see if hypnotherapy or hypnosis would help you. Um, I think that um, 
you know, it's fun to go out to a nightclub when we used to be able to go out to nightclubs, mm-hmm. um, you know, and watch the guy up on the stage, put people, you know, hypno- hypnotize people and things like that. Um, of course, that's not what hypnosis and therapy is like. Um, but I do feel that it's a valuable tool, but it is not always necessary. I have a chapter in the book where I, where I talk about that. Do I really need to get therapy? People ask me that. Well, you know, I think I'm an experiencer, but I don't really remember anything. You think it would help if I got some regression? Well, you know, maybe, maybe it would. And I talk to them a little bit more and ask them some more questions so I can guide them, you know, um, give them a little guidance on whether I think it would be the right way to go or not. But if they want to do it, you know, they do it. Um, So what I do not believe is that hypnosis, when it's used correctly, is harmful. So there are many people who say that hypnosis is harmful, people who believe that it can turn you into a zombie, people believe that you're going to give up your will and all of this if you allow yourself to be hypnotized. As a hypnotherapist, I have heard that so many times throughout my career, you can imagine. Um, and this is not a career that, this is a career that you kind of take a lot of flack for being a hypnotherapist and a counselor. So I have heard a lot, but the truth is it is very simple. It's a very simple process. Um, everybody goes through hypnosis every day, natural hypnosis that, you know, you're reading a book, you're really focused. Somebody comes in and says something to you and you're like, you're out of it. You don't hear them. You're watching a movie and you're really engrossed and you don't hear what's going on around you or you're staring out the window and you're just caught up in whatever's going on outside and you, you know, you just lose your train of thought. Um, So the human mind has a natural kind of hypnotic process that it does for a lot of reasons. And so it's simple. It's basically a natural thing that we do. The only difference is that it's staged because that means you come into my office, you sit down, we chat, And I help you to reach that point. Whereas if you're sitting on your porch and you're looking at a beautiful sunset, you could just be off in, you know, la la land somewhere completely on your own. But it is very, very much the same thing. So it's very safe. Um, Sometimes people are afraid that they're going to, their minds are going to be taken over or, you know, they're going to be brainwashed. The truth is that hypnotherapy is not, it's just not strong enough to brainwash somebody. It's just not. Uh, if you brainwash someone, there's a lot more that has to be involved there. Um, drugs, abuse, um, all kinds of things have to be all put together in order to brainwash someone. It's a very difficult thing to brainwash people. And so hypnosis alone just can't do that. So while I, while I feel it's very helpful, um, I think that it's very easy for people to do. There's self-hypnosis. You can do it. But I think if you want to try, if you're trying to explore something, it's probably better to work with someone who can kind of guide you um, along the way and also can teach you some new things about it and how to use your mind that you might not have known before that can be helpful. So, um, yeah, that's what I'd say about hypnosis. If people ask me if they should have regression or something, I always say the same thing. I always ask, well, how are you doing? Are you having trouble with your contact experiences? Are you having nightmares? Are you having PTSD? Are you having some other issues that are causing you problems in your life? And if they say no, then I usually say, well, you probably don't need therapy. If you want to talk to somebody about it, sure, go ahead, find somebody good to talk to and talk to them about it. If they say, yeah, hey man, I can't sleep. You know, I went from drinking a beer every two days to, a, you know, a six pack every day because I can't deal with what's going on. Um, I, I am just afraid of the dark, all these other things. Then it's like, okay, you need to see someone if your life is being disrupted that way. So, and there's one more thing I'd like to say about hypnotherapy. This is a, um, there is a belief in the ufology field that Memories, actually, it's more about memory recovery, but it's involved with hypnosis. Memories that are recovered through hypnosis or therapy are not as valid or believable as memories that a person remembers on their own, like what we would call spontaneous or conscious memories. 
-hmm. And that is, it can be true, but it is not always true. So if you use, uh, if you go to a experienced and knowledgeable therapist to help recover memories or help you work through some issues, then you don't have to worry about any problems that could come from that. Um, oftentimes, you can actually remember more and get further if you have someone to assist you than if you just remember it on your own. Because memory is another huge can of worms uh, that is very difficult to, to understand and work with. So um, whether a person remembers through therapy or they remember on their own, they remember. And it's up to them then to decide how those memories are going to inform their life. So is there less? Long answer. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm really interested in hip, hypnosis uh, myself because as a kid, I grew up in eastern Washington, Washington State University. My dad was a professor there. <clears throat> and my friend and I would go check out all the hypnosis books. We were like 10 years old or something. We had access to this university library. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, it's back when you had to look up stuff and actually go get the books and everything, which is kind of half the fun. It's like, oh, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> Checked out. But, mm -hmm. So we read all about hypnosis spent a lot of hours hypnotizing each other in quotes. I mean, I think we did. We were, our 10-year-olds, we were pretty serious yeah. about it, mm -hmm. trying to plant post-hypnotic suggestions and, and all that. And so I have, I have a very keen interest in it, and I really have never heard one way or another, and I think you just kind of ex expressed an opinion as <clears throat> far as regression and memory retrieval. It sounds like you're saying it's not likely that that there's um when you retrieve a memory under hypnosis that there's any embellishment or fabrication or at least there's not a higher chance of that as compared to conscious recall recollection mm -hmm. I and mean, is there any evidence would you say between those two options is it more likely or less likely or does it depend on a lot of other factors um well the experience in hypnosis depends on many factors um, and it actually depends more on the subject, the person who's being hypnotized, than the hypnotherapist mm -hmm. because of the way that they're going to, to work through it and the, the way that they're going to process what's happening. But um, mm -hmm. it is true that it's possible in, during a hypnotherapy session for a therapist to put ideas into someone's mind, uh, often called false memories, which... I don't like the term false memories because to me, a memory is a memory. There's no such thing as a false memory, but I understand the definition of that term. So um, sure, it's possible to be influenced by a therapist to think of something and to remember something that may not be exactly the way um, it should be remembered. Let me put it that way. Right. That's why I always say, if you seriously want to recover memories, then you should be going to a trained therapist who is not going to do that because it's very easy to do, very easy to do. Now, for people like you who are just learning, you were interested, you were playing, you were having a good time, I don't think anybody came out with any scars or any crazy tics or anything like that from, right? You all came out okay, the both of you did. Oh, and in most know. cases, <laughs> in most cases, that's what will happen. Yeah. Um, but people can go and pay a lot of money, a lot of money for hypnosis and hypnotherapy and have someone plant something in their mind or help embellish that. It's very easy to do for a therapist who is not experienced and really not qualified to know right. how to work with someone. So, oh yeah, it does happen. Um, but what I meant to say is that your natural recall of memories is not pure either. People don't understand what memory is and what your memories are. Every time you remember an event, it changes. Every single time it changes because it's influenced by how you felt at the time, how you feel when you're remembering it, um, what other memories come out and mix in with it, what emotions are involved in it, and what you're doing when it comes to you. Are you listening to music and all of a sudden it triggers something? 
there's no such thing as a pure memory. It, it's impossible. That's just not how the human mind works. So this is one reason that it's, it's another good reason I always say to work with a therapist because you have to try to get through everything and just sort of get it into what makes sense to you, into kind of a picture or a whole. Um, but so when it comes to recovering memories, to me, it's like 50-50. No, you're never going to get a pure one anyway. So if you're more comfortable with what you remember yourself, or you would prefer to go to a therapist, either way, but just make sure you get someone who's really qualified and can help you um, without putting things, you know, in your mind. So, so maybe a more fundamental question about going to a therapist. And you said you don't have a private practice anymore, correct? Did I pick up on how, how do people, how, how would you charge people who came to you as an experiencer? And a better question would be, would their insurance pay for something like that? Um, no, probably not. The answer to the no, no, I don't think any insurance companies in this country are enlightened enough, but there are insurance companies who will pay for hypnotherapy, for hypnosis, absolutely, for treatment of, of alcoholism and um, PTSD and Smoking. all kinds of things like that. Yeah. yeah, they will pay for that kind of thing. But if the therapist is honest, then of course they have to give you they have to give you that kind of treatment. Like if you came to me and said, hey, I really want to work on my experiences, but, you know, I can't pay for it. So let's just put down, I want to stop smoking. Uh, you know, that would be, that would be a fel Ethical. felony yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. I would never want to do that. Um, but most therapists do charge money and some of them charge a lot of money. It depends on their experience. It depends on where they are, what part of the country they live in. And it just depends on what they want to charge. If you go to conferences, UFO conferences, and there are therapists there who have do private sessions, um, they are frequently very expensive. Mm. So yeah, you're probably going to pay for it. That's another reason that I tell people, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you don't need to go to therapy, don't, because you're probably going to have to put some money into it, and you may be paying, you no, know, ninety, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars a session, depending on where you go to. And if you don't really need to do that, you know, don't do it. I, I think uh, that the several of your groups that I've sat in, I've kind of sensed that as a way. I mean, not that that's a, a therapy group per se; it's more like a support group. But that's kind of a way. You don't charge for that, you know, just no. anybody who could get on Zoom. So I could see where that would be kind of beneficial. Mm -hmm. Let's group, to your... Groups are always good. When I had my private practice, I always utilized groups. I always had a private group that was going so that I could help my clients uh, go into that too. So they would be in private therapy and they would be into group therapy also. Uh, and then if you go to a conference now, a lot of the conferences are charging for their experience or groups, which I think is not a good thing to do. But, you know, I don't run the conference, so they are doing that. But um, my uh, my online group, no, I don't I don't charge for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's read your book for a second, then Dave, if I'll shut up and you can ask more questions. Um, so where, where can you get your book? I think I bought it off of Amazon. Uh, um, the book is only available on Amazon. Well, or through me, yeah, and so I usually have a few copies just for my friends who are here locally. It is available on Amazon. It is available in paperback and also Kindle. Okay. Um, and I'm in the process of working on an audio book, so hopefully it'll come out on Audible before too long. Um, so yeah, people can get it there. If I'm front selling it, you know, a lot of times I go to conferences and have a table and talk to people and sell the book and. Um, and so it's uh, available mainly. And you, you, you can kind of do that with us too. You can market your book through us if you want. Um, mm -hmm. So a couple of three things that stuck in my mind, which has more to do with the types of interactions that mm -hmm. you've been uh, alluding to and talking about. So you have a list, one of the chapters in your book, mm -hmm. there's a list of places that beings have come from. Where did you get that list? Is that just what experiencers have said? Like, 
you know, a certain group of ETs have come from Zeta Reticuli. A certain, certain groups, I think they even uh, um, referenced the Pleiades in that chapter. Do you remember which one I'm talking about? Um, there is a section in the appendix oh, called that's the, right. mo the Most Commonly Reported Alien Beings yeah, Interacting okay, yeah. with Humans. And so there's... Um, it may look like there's a lot here, but some people say there's, you know, over hundreds of beings. Of course, there's only about four pages of them in the book. I couldn't put any more in here. I just put the most commonly uh, reported ones and primarily for people who are not as familiar or not in the field. So these are things that people have told me. These are things I've heard from experiencers. I've heard from investigators. And yeah, that's where, that's where that information comes from. I have not seen these beings. Um, so I can't say this is all from my own personal experience, but this, this is acceptable knowledge within the ufological community and among experiencers, the most common one. Talk about um, star seeds, uh, my labs, talk about some of those kind of unique uh, encounters that uh, you talk about in hybrids. So have you have you dealt with uh, experiencers who are hybrids? I have had a few clients who are hybrids, very few, but I've met many people who were not my clients um, who believe they are hybrids. It's still a, min a minority um, in this field. There are still not as many people as there are what we would call just general experiencers or contactees, but I do have an understanding. I also write about that, just the basic things about it. There is variety within the hybridization processes. There are different ways that people claim that they, that hybrids can be created. Um, and it's a, it is a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing. Um, many hybrids, some hybrids that I have worked with, well, all hybrids that I have worked with have claims of differences, physiological, mostly physiological differences, that things that they have physiologically or anatomically that are different from their earth, so-called earth families. I have never had a hybrid client who came to me with proof. However, you can see some of the things if you look at people um, that you might be able to see that certain physiolo physiology that they have. But um, there are people who are hybrids who almost all of them claim that they have different physiological and anatomical things, aspects. Um, they have different abilities, different gifts. Uh, they all have purposes for being here. And this goes for star seeds as well. They're different from hybrids, but um, there is a mission here. They're here for a purpose. And uh, that's a fascinating, uh, another fascinating aspect of this this huge phenomenon is hybrids and star seeds, and they're quite different. So um, hybrids can be, there are hybrids that supposedly live on earth among us. I have met a few of them who claim to be. And then there are hybrids who don't come to earth. Um, some of them are created on ships, we are told, and they are never able to live in earth's atmosphere or on the earth, and so they never come to the earth. But they are hybrids of human and extraterrestrial or otherworldly beings. They live on ships, or they live wherever the home mothership or home planet of the people who created them live. So um, hybrids are here. Some hybrids are not here. They have different, they're just, they're part human being probably mostly human being, and so they're people. They have the same things that the rest of us have. They just have some different things from most of us. So does that kind of answer your question? Star seeds are a, a different, they're kind of a different thing. Mm -hmm. What about the my labs? I find that the experience kind of interesting, where mm -hmm. people report seeing humans that are somehow dressed in military garb or uh, that have some kind of military uh, tone to what's going on. Talk about that. Um, so my labs or my labs, I pronounce them my labs, my labs, it doesn't matter. It's M-I-L-A-B um, for people who aren't aware of that. And it just stands for military, military abduction. Right. Yeah. yeah. So 
Um, they are experiences that people have where they are abducted and taken against their will, which is what an abduction is. And they are taken by what appear to be humans who are di disguised as ETs, is what we usually hear. Um, and people who have experienced these things say that it's pretty easy to tell the difference. And I also talk about that in my writings, is how can you tell the difference between a MILAB and a true otherworldly or ET contact or abduction experience. Um, MILABs are, uh, I mean, we just don't have the technology on this earth that extraterrestrial beings do. So a MILAB experience is always going to be very different technologically. Um, people are treated differently. They are handled differently. They are transported differently. Um, all the little details um, are, are very different. Um, why do these things happen? We don't really know, but it seems uh, because many of the people who are taken in mill labs are experiencers who have experienced genuine contact. So we believe that maybe what the mill lab group is trying to do is get information from the individual about their genuine experience or contact. They're trying to get the lowdown on the ETs who took them. What did they look like? Where were they from? Tell us all about it. You know, we're going to give you drugs. We're going to give you truth serum. We're going to hypnotize you. We're going to do things to try to help get this information out of you. And those are things that MILAB experiencers talk about is being used in those ways. Typically, MILAB experiencers are traumatic. I've never heard of a good, positive MILAB experience. So um, typically there are, but there are some fascinating MILAB experiences. And, and what I'm wondering about is, does that imply some kind of relationship between the military, i.e. the government mm -hmm. on Earth, and the ETs? Some kind of weird agreement that will let you take people if you share technology with us. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, way, way back uh, when Eisenhower, when it's claimed that Eisenhower went on the golfing vacation and actually yeah. met with the ETs, mm -hmm. supposedly there was an agreement made that he said, you have permission to take some, a certain amount of our people, take some of our people, abduct them, do whatever you want with them, and we'll give you this good technology that we have. Now, whether that really happened or not, but that's, a, that's you know, pretty much believed as a, a truth in ufology. Um, so it, people sometimes in mill labs report seeing extraterrestrial beings there, either taking part in the process, beings that they believe are actually real genuine ETs, um, either, as I said, taking part in whatever's going on or observing. Frequently, it's observing. And some experiencers in these mill lab events have even felt communication from the ETs. So while they're having whatever's done to them here, they're receiving communication telepathically from ETs who may be there observing. So, um, so yeah, uh, there is, in many cases, I'm sure there is some kind of cooperation between otherworldly beings and those beings uh, that the human beings that are abducting. But, is it the military? Is it the government? Or is it some kind of black project somewhere underground that we all know about? You know, in ufology, we hear about those things. We don't know what it is. But it's also a minor part of the contact experience. There are not a lot of those. Not like what we consider to be a typical abduction experience from otherworldly beings. But they are fascinating. And as I said, they are, I've never heard one that was positive. They're always negative. Sometimes people really suffer through them, especially those in the military. Uh. Many people in the military have been, uh, have been subjected to these things. And they're pretty much a captive audience because, you know, they're under control of the government of the military. And some of them have suffered greatly with like long, you know, long lasting problems after these experiences. Mm -hmm. So two more things, Dave, and then I'm going to let you uh, finish this up here. Okay. Um, you know the name Dr. Roger Lear. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So have you dealt with anybody that's had implants? I have had a few individuals who say they have implants. I've never seen any. No one has ever brought me one. 
I've talked to a couple people in the ERT who said they have implants. Um, I spoke with one gentleman who was looking for a place to sell his implants. And he was asking me if I know anybody who might be willing to buy, to buy them. He had a couple of them. Um, and, but, and I don't, I don't mean to make fun of him by saying that. I just mean to say that there are people out there who have different ways of looking at implants and implants have different experiences on people, different people as part of their contact experiences. So I haven't had very many clients of my own who have implants, but I've talked to a lot of people who have and people who call me for consults and stuff frequently say they have them. And um, as you probably know, the ERT has a collection of not real implants, but we have an archive of pictures that people have sent us of marks and implants and things of that nature. I don't think I've seen that. So where's that in the ERT? Just ask George. Ask George, George. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So the last thing I have, um, and then Dave, you can bring us home here, because we don't want this to be like an abduction experience for uh, Gwen. Um, so what about uh, evidence of uh, ETs or, and I know I hesitate to call them ETs. I, I sometimes kind of want to call them ultra terrestrials because they might be from different dimensions as well as mm -hmm. they could be from outer space. What about uh, examples of healing? And I'm just reading about something uh, about, I think you talk about that in your book. So uh, mm -hmm. examples of people who've been healed from certain medical conditions by these uh, beings. Um, there are hundreds, hundreds of reports of medical healings done by extraterrestrial beings. I mean, there are a lot of them. And the person you want to talk to and read about for these things is Preston Dennett. He's yes, written, I was gonna say. Yeah, he's written three books, maybe four books now on the topic. He's a prolific author and he writes on a lot of other things as well. But he is really the expert and has talked to literally hundreds of people who claim to have medical healings. Um, it's, it's very common. Um, mm. Why does it happen? Um, it could, some, some of them are reported as kind of just like uh, accidents. Like there's a very famous one about, um, I don't remember the state that it was in, and I think it was back in the 50s, of two police officers who were out on their patrol at night in their car, and they looked up and saw something in the sky, and so they started to follow it, and they're like following along in their car, you know, and it's, it's above them, and uh, one of the officers who was in the passenger seat had injured his hand the day, a day or so before, and the injury was still quite fresh and, and still in pretty bad shape. So he had his hand out the window like this. They're following along and all of a sudden, the flying saucer UFO does what UFOs do, made a sudden quick turn and took off in the other direction. When it came over them, there was light coming down from it and that beamed right down on the car and just caught the car and then it just kept going and they turned around and took off and of course, they, it lost them and they weren't able to follow it any longer. The police officer the next day claimed that he had a miraculous healing from that. His hand, which had been very badly damaged, was almost healed, and the day before it was still in really bad shape. So that's a very well-known one. Um, there have been other very well-known ones. Um, one of the ones that I write about in my book that is one of my favorite ones is um, a guy was traveling home one night from college. This was in northern Arizona. You know, there's, it's mountainous up there. And he, Flagstaff. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, kind of that area up there. He was driving home. It was very late. He was coming home from college for the holidays. He fell asleep and went off the road where there was, was not a guardrail. The car just went right off the road. So he, he had fallen asleep. So he was asleep when the car went over the edge. Car crashed. After a while, he comes to and he can see there's a, a moon. And he can see the car not far away from him. And he's on the ground and his body is just like, he's all crunched, he's all crushed up. He's, he, he feels like his body is just crushed. He doesn't know what's going on. He can feel light. And so this is like about midnight or so, late or very early in the morning. He kind of looks up, he's in shock. He's half conscious, half unconscious. And he looks up and he, what he sees is the moon coming closer. 
So he sees this big bright moon and all of a sudden it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it comes down lower to him to the point where he can actually feel the warmth from this thing on his body. So he has a healing experience at that point, which he doesn't remember until several years later when he, he decides to have therapy and do some regression to try to, uh, to, try to remember it. Um, and what he remembers is something came down and beings came out of it. They stood around him. They had different kinds of implements, tools that they used to put energy into his body uh, to heal him. And then they took off and they left him there. Um, and, but they, they made a connection with him mentally, telepathically. And they told him, go over to the car and turn on your cell phone and put the light on, you know, the light on your, you can set your cell phone to a, a an SOS Flashlight. signal. Yeah, yeah. And you do an SOS signal. So he crawled literally over to the car, which wasn't very far away, pulled himself up onto the car, found his uh, phone, which was still in his pocket, set the SOS signal, put it on top of the car and crashed and collapsed again and passed out. The next thing he remembered is there were people around him. This time it was like real people. And a family who was traveling along the road above in a, a couple of kids and parents and in a motor home had seen the SOS signal blinking. Uh -huh. So they stopped, they went down, they got him, uh, they called for help, ambulance came, they got him to the hospital at the nearest town. He uh, took him a long, long time to heal because he was very se severely damaged. And, but he didn't remember all of these things until he went through uh, the therapy later to remember it. So um, I find that fascinating that he, they came and I asked him, I said, well, why do you think they were there? He said, oh, I know why we're there. And I said, well, okay, you know, give, why were they there? He said, oh, I'm not going to talk about it. What? He said, it's personal and I won't talk about it. Hmm. And I said, well, if you ever decide that you want to share it, please let me know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm pretty sure what was going on is he had a relationship with them of some kind. But I don't know if they were following him. I have no, I, I can't tell you. But that's one of my favorite stories. And that was a client of mine. Um, it's a good one. Told that one. Dave, we've got about 10 more minutes. So okay. um, take us home. Well, Gwen, do you, do you have your book there that you could hold up? I do. So that... Dan, is that the one that you have? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Forbidden Questions, and Dan and I both read that. Yeah. And I like the cover there. <laughs> Little E.T. reminiscent, right? Uh-huh, right. On uh -huh. home. <laughs> yeah. um, but I wanted to compliment you on that book. I think it's unique. I, You know, between Dan and I, we probably read 100 UFO books, I would guess, over the years, or, you, you know, E.T. related and I think yours is unique. I kind of liken it to um, uh, Richard Dolan's huh. book. Mm -hmm. uh, what, it, what was it called? After Disclosure. Mm -hmm. I really liked that because it wasn't just recounting of, you know, UFO reports from 1955 or whatever. Mm -hmm. it wasn't. Those are fascinating, of course. But after a while, when you've been looking at this stuff for 25, 30, whatever, more years, you want to get to the next stage, which is some of the, the higher questions, you know, mm -hmm. why, uh, what will happen when disclosure comes about? You know, how, are, how will our lives change? Why are the ETs here? What's the point? You know, what are the motivations of the different parties? What are the different theories about why, you know, and Gwen right goes into mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff. She covers a whole lot of stuff a very broad range in, you know, shallower detail, but that's because mm -hmm. she wants to get it all fit in there and give you an overview. So she did a really good job of summarizing, giving you enough information about each particular subject so that you come away with it with a very broad understanding of it. It's not just like, oh, here are the stats that Project Blue Book um, concluded. You know, that was the first book I ever read in UFO um, in literature was um, J. Allen Hynek's The UFO Experience. I picked it up at a, you know, a used bookstore back when we used to have those. And for 
75 cents or something. And I laughed when I saw the title. I'm just like, what is that? <laughs> You know, but after I read it, my life was changed because yeah. I realized that it was a real thing. You know, serious scientists were working on this problem. Mm -hmm. and from that point on, it, it, you know, it lasted 30 years and it will last until I'm dead. I have a feeling. But I liken Gwen's book to, um, again, like I said, after disclosure, because it kind of looks ahead rather than recounting the past, rehashing um, you know, as necessary as that is to document the past, it has some more interesting questions to me. So I do really recommend it because Thank again, you. Sort of the, the, you know, the, the different models of why ET is doing all this stuff, you know, why, what are the possibilities? And that's what I'm very interested in is looking ahead to the future. And so I wanted to bring up one other, um, <clears throat> topic and that is I'm sure that you're probably familiar with Carol Rosen I think is how you oh, say yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Is it Rosen or Rosen? Um, I call her Rosen. Mm -hmm. It's like R-O-S-I-N yes. but she was the mm -hmm. as far as I know the only female um, CEO or you know high-ranking um, employee or official or, or actually I think she was a, I don't remember what her actual title is of an aerospace corporation though which is a very um amazing achievement but so she has credentials she knows what she's talking about and she was a a confidant of uh, Werner von Braun the the scientist brought over through uh, project paperclip right um mm -hmm. the Nazi well I, there's some debate about whether he was a Nazi I think it's safe to say that he was at least a closet member of the Nazi party because he was a, a high He had up. to be. <laughs> yeah. So he, he had this theory, and I'm sure you know, we've talked about it on our program, that's always stuck with me in when I'm talk, considering this whole UFO ET phenomenon, and that is that there's a plan in place. He maintained that um, the, the government, as an overarching term, I think, It'd be nice to know who we're talking about in the government, but I don't know the if government. You can that. Mm -hmm. It's some conglomeration of the intelligence apparatus, intelligence agencies, and of course, you can't forget corporate America and corporate other countries. I think that's where the real focus is. Obviously, it's in the quasi-governmental, um, these special asset, access projects and so on. That's where I think most of the stuff happens because, because it's shielded from public access so well. So the nexus of these um, two entities. And so he said, for people who aren't familiar with it, that there would be a progression, I think, starting with even the 50s, the 60s, with a series of enemies um, that we would do battle with as a country or as a world. And, of course, we started with the communists, went into the... Um, rogue nations, I think, terrorist states, you know, Middle Eastern countries, of course. We've had plenty of that over the last several decades. Then the next in the progression would be asteroids, the threat of asteroids. There's been quite a bit of that. And mm -hmm. again, that story that I talked about, uh, that I read about a couple of days ago, the Oumuamua coming as the first interstellar visitor was kind of an interesting spin on that whole asteroid mm -hmm. um, part of the von Braun's story. But, but of course, the last piece of that puzzle was an ET invasion, which he maintained would be a fake one. Um, and it would be undertaken uh, by intelligence agencies. And so I wanted to ask as my final question to Gwen, do you see that as a, a plausible, do you see the same trend that I'm seeing you think that's plausible that it could be pulled off in such a way that it would um, achieve its desired result, which he said was to basically unite the world against a common enemy in order to, I don't know, what did he, in order to, to get total control over the, you know, the, the population, basically, make us easier to scare and manipulate and blah, blah, blah. I, I think we're already there in a lot of ways, but can you speak about that and let us know what you know about that, that model? 
and whether you think it's uh, valid. Um, well, I would say that um, uh, Stephen Greer, Steve Greer, I'm sure you know who Dr. Steve Greer is, um, is also a proponent of that theory. Right. Um, it's his belief that, that that's what's going on and that um, that, and that kind of uh, is close to the Milab thing, too, only he believes that there are, I think, androids or something like that that are being used rather than humans, and what well, they may be. Um, I think that it is, I think it's less likely that there is some kind of organized thing or organized group that is powerful enough to really put on this big show, because this show that I see and that we're involved in is the biggest show ever. And when I say show, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I don't mean that it's not real. It's like, it's a big puzzle, whatever term you want to use for that. Um, I don't think that there's any group here on earth that can do that. Um, there may be smaller groups, you know, that feel that they can influence by disclosing certain things now and then or not or whether they want to hold things, which apparently the U.S. government has always done, excuse me, and in withholding information since Roswell and before. Um, I, that's kind of the way I feel about it, is um, that if it's happening, I believe that what's really happening is with experiencers. This is where we go to learn what's really happening. Now, if this thing is being made up by humans or some underground group or black government somewhere, then maybe it is. Um, but it is a global experience that many millions of people are having. And so as a therapist and investigator, that's where I go. I always start with that. So... Hmm. As far as that model is um, concerned, I can just tell you what I've heard other people say. I haven't really made up my mind. I'm very familiar with Steve Greer and met him and heard him speak and know about him quite a bit. Um, yeah. So I can understand where he's coming with that, too. Um, I, I probably would not be a real follower of his in, in that respect. I'm not sure that I would accept oh, that. It's mutually exclusive or it isn't mutually exclusive that there is a real awakening via experience or, you know, that sure. could certainly be going on con concurrently with right. this big plan to, to do the big show. And in this case, that would be a derogatory term because it was <laughs> a deception, um, yeah. potentially in an effort to offset what is being discovered through experiencers. Because like you said, the experiencer experience is largely um, enlightening or, or at least it tends to be that way at sort of an awakening. So um, anyway, I don't know if you were, you meant thought I was implying that the experiencer phenomenon was part of the big show, the, the big deception or not. Deception. No, no, no. Yeah, that isn't what I, I think it's yeah. happening at the same time. But, mm -hmm. but yes, that's a good point about having the resources to pull off something that would be compelling enough to convince everyone that we were being invaded. But then again, they are. but yeah, I mean, no, mm -hmm. it would be, it would be a lot easier to mm -hmm. do what Stephen Greer says is happening is that um, some kind of intelligence groups are, have learned how they've had the technology to create these androids that are so real looking that yeah. can function to make people believe. I think that would be easier um, to do something like that than it would be to create individual personal contact experiences because the things that people are experiencing are just not like that. I wonder though, remember Independence Day where just the presence of motherships hovering in the atmosphere for, you know, for days or months or years on end, wouldn't that in itself be enough to kind of achieve that end? You know, the aliens are there, they're threatening, we need to send the $10 trillion sure. to the military industrial complex instead of yeah. just $1 trillion every year mm -hmm. or whatever. So I, I believe that people who have those kind of uh, resources are mm -hmm. usually pretty um, engrossed in or busy doing what they need to do for their own comfort and their own 
uh, whatever it is that they want to do. And so I just can't see knowing human beings the way that we are. I think human beings are great. I don't mean to say that human beings are not good beings, but knowing human beings and how we work and what our motivations are and things that we could be really that organized or that we would be maybe organized. Isn't the word maybe, um, maybe, uh, I don't know, not selfish, maybe uh, beneficent beings, People want their own things. They want their own comfort. They want their own will. And if you've got money, you know, you just want more of that. So, um, so I can't answer. I don't know that, but I do understand, you know, that what you're talking about there. Yeah. Well, we won't, we won't know until we actually, you know, witness something. It seems this year, what are your feelings about this year in terms of moving further down the, the path? Do you see an acceleration uh, from the people that you interact with? I mean, is it consistent or? Um, I find that, I think I mentioned it briefly before, that the experiences that, we're, that we are hearing, that people are reporting over the last 10 years or so are more positive than they used to be. I think it's going to continue probably in that direction. Um, I don't, like I said, we don't really know why. There are a few reasons why it could be. But if you want to think of human beings as being able to uh, grow spiritually and mentally and intellectually, and if there is something like ascension, that we can ascend to a higher level, whether it's physiological, spiritual, mental, um, social, whatever it happens to be. I hope that we are going to continue. I kind of think we're moving in that direction, even though this past year has been so divisive and so uh, hard in so many ways. Um, I think wise people who say that this year was something that we needed or that we could learn from anyway was a good thing for us. It was just something that came that we needed. So I would say that I, I would guess that in the UFO field, there's going to be more disclosure, maybe from the government, um, for what they know through the military, if more things are cited. I think that um, people are going to continue to report experiences that are on the positive side. And um, there probably will be fewer abduction uh, scenarios, although they're still there. There probably will be fewer on those. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking will happen. But I think it's going to continue. It has to continue. I think it's yeah. been here since before recorded time. So whether we talk about it or not doesn't mean it's not happening. You know, we're just striving to understand it. Well, uh, Gwen, <laughs> on behalf of uh, Dave and I, I'd really like to thank you. I, and we went through some bits and starts to try to do this. This is oh, yeah. the four, <laughs> fourth time was the charm. But uh, you're a great guest. I think your book is would be one that both Dave and I would highly recommend. And if you ever want to come back and visit with us again, you're more than welcome to do that. Well, I thank you very much. I, I'm glad, too, that we were finally able to get here, even though I'm a little bit uh, fuzzy tonight. Um, still, um, I appreciate that we finally could get to do this. And um, I'm glad that you guys are doing this effort that you're making. It's always exciting to see people who are, who are really um, – open-minded and um it's been a pleasure to be interviewed by you so thank, thank you. you so i have an off the wall question for you uh is your birthday sometime between the end of september and the end of october so i'm going to ask you why are you asking that what I'm, makes you yeah, i'm too. picking up a vibe from you <laughs> and, and um, i might be a wrong vibe but, uh, uh, yes it is Okay, that's, that's well, all I need. <laughs> we're going to interview Dan the Psychic next. Week. No, I know. <laughs> no. Well, you know, everybody, all the psychics I hang out with, they say, well, you know, everybody's psychic, so I don't well, know. Well, I agree, too. I, I agree that everybody is to some degree, but, um, yeah. Some are more than others. Oh, anyway. absolutely, yeah. So. Take good care of yourself. I hope you're not getting sick. Oh, me well, too. <laughs> yeah, just stay in touch with us. Okay, thanks. Um, and if I want to get uh, the book to you or anything, can I just email you with information about it or so that you no, can put it? Yeah, put, do it today because he's going to okay. be the one who's actually going to put, put it on YouTube and kind of do the, the final touches. Okay, and I think you gave me Dave's um, email already. Dsphinx1 at 
Comcast.net, something like that. Yeah, I sent the Zoom link through it. Oh, through that. Okay, so I can look there then. Grab that Find one. It. Yeah, that's my main, the main one. Okay. Okay, so who are you guys interviewing next? I want to look forward to seeing that one. Do you know uh, who you're doing next? Yeah, Leah. Who is it? You know, I spend a lot of time trying to network with people. I think I think the next person is our friend Lisa Holm, who is a psychic, and oh, cool. she's she, she's going to talk about. I took a class from her when I first moved to Olympia twenty years ago. I took a class in animal communication. So oh she, yeah, cool. She's going to talk about how to uh, talk to animals telepathically. Oh, and oh I good! Use that. I definitely will watch that one. I, I use that with my dogs. I used to have dog. Well, Dave runs a, a veterinary hospital, and his wife, Paula, was our, our vet for many years. So oh, he's cool. seen us with a lot of dogs, but I, I use that. And then at the end of the month, I don't know if you know who Tom Can Cantrell is. He's a Washington Bigfoot guy. So he'll oh, come okay. talk about uh, everything you always want to know about Bigfoot, but we're having a lot of fun with this. Oh, oh yeah. Well, man got retired. He, he filled up the schedule. I mean, you got well, like two dozen people, <laughs> but I mean, we're, we're lucky to have people say, yeah, sure, I'll come on and talk, and people seem to like just the conversational thing, mm -hmm. and I Glenn said that everyone feels like we're doing this because we're very interested, I'd say obsessed about it. We're not... <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> we're not asking the same stupid questions over and over, I hope. We're yeah. trying to come up with different questions and really get people to, you know, to give us some different answers so our audience can hear a, a more in-depth perspective, you know, mm -hmm. which Gwen definitely has. So we, we appreciate that. Okay, and, thank and, you. And one thing I was going to say, tell Gwen is, so I was listening to this podcast, or no, it was an interview on Coast to Coast with somebody I'd like to have on the, on the um uh, the program. Her name is Karen Dahlman, but she's an expert in using the Ouija board. And and why that was interesting to me was she started talking about using the Ouija board to contact aliens as as part of that uh, that close encounter of the fifth kind kind of thing. Have you ever heard anybody do that? I have not, but I can understand why it might work. I can, yeah. I think that's an interesting thing. I hope and you I have her too. on too. Yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we'll All right. Let you know. Hope you feel better. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. We'll send send you an email. Okay. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye bye.